flying over a country and driving it and walking it. What we do on Sunday mornings is we walk it. We're walking through an area. Uh, on Sunday evenings, we're flying over. And so the, uh, the theme, I think, still is, for these purposes, uh, the, a perfect gospel for an imperfect church because the gospel is Paul's only hope he holds out for the, for the many messes that, that constitute the church at Corinth. And what I want you to do tonight is I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Mark that. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 and 13. I thought I had a sneeze coming, so I'll, I'll keep this handy. I'll try to be faithful to mute my microphone before it occurs, if it indeed occurs. All right, stand with me if you would. Let's, uh, if you'll follow along while I read these. If you don't have your Bible with you, we'll put the text on the screen for you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. You will recall when we were studying through this that this is where Paul was, was uh, perplexed because they were doing the, chapter 5, the whole immorality issue, chapter 6, taking one other to court, uh, chapter 6 on further that they were not, they were being loose in their morals as related to the temple prostitutes. And so he challenges them here. He says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And then over to chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands, and the picture there, remember, stands erect, that he stands straight and tall. Let anyone who thinks he stands uh, take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Uh, Lord, help us tonight to see this wonderful letter to a very troubled church, which, if understood, should give any church in any situation, reason to have hope and be encouraged. Thank you. Please be seated. You remember that the theme passage, John 5, 39 and 40, we've, we've read it dozens of times by now that this is Jesus who says the Scripture testifies of him. And if we will read the Scriptures to find him, we will find him, and he will find us, and we'll be saved. Let's show the video now of, from the Bible Project, and then we'll, we'll get into uh, some summaries, some outlines, and then some focuses of 1 Corinthians. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, written to a church community that Paul knew really well. Corinth was a major port city in the ancient world and had lots of temples to Greek and Roman gods. It was a big economic center. And so Paul strategically came here as a missionary. He spent a year and a half there getting to know people, talking to them about Jesus. And a whole bunch of people became followers of Jesus and formed a church community. You can read about all of this in Acts chapter 18. So after a while, Paul moved on to start churches in other cities, and he started getting reports that things were not going well at all back at the church in Corinth. It was plagued by all kinds of problems, and that's why he wrote this letter. It's broken up into five main parts, along with a final greeting. And these five sections correspond to five main problems that Paul is addressing. And so the letter reads like a collection of short essays on different topics, but there are these core ideas that unite all of the pieces together. So here's what he does in each section. He describes the problem, but then he always responds to that problem with some part of the story of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus. And he shows how they're actually not living out what they say they believe. And so this letter is all about learning to think about every area of life through the lens of the gospel. So let's dive in and see how he does it. In chapters 1 through 4, the problem is that there are these divisions in the church. 
There are some other teachers who had come through town since Paul left, a guy named Apollos and then Peter, and people had picked their favorite teacher and then became groupies around that leader and then started to talk bad and disrespect people who favored another leader or teacher. And so Paul, his response to this is kind of sarcastic and sharp. He says, you have to be kidding me, right? The church is not a popularity contest. The church is a community of people who are centered around Jesus. Its leaders and its teachers are simply servants of Jesus. So while you might prefer one leader more than another, it's not worth dividing over and certainly not speaking poorly about each other. The center of the church is Jesus and the good news about who he is and what he's done. In chapters 5 through 7, Paul addresses some problems related to sex. There were a number of people sleeping around in the church. One guy with his stepmother, a number of other people still worshiping at the local temples to greet gods and sleeping with the prostitutes who worked there. Not only that, but there were people in the church who were saying that this was all just fine. They said, hey, we're free in Christ. God's grace is bottomless, right? It's fine. Paul says it's not fine. And with the gospel in hand, he shows just how wrong-headed this kind of thinking is. He says, remember, first of all, Jesus died for your sins, including the ruin of broken relationships that's caused by sexual misconduct. And so if you're a Christian... Sexual integrity is one of the main ways that we respond to Jesus' love and grace. Paul also reminds them that just as Jesus was physically raised from the dead, so our bodies will be raised from the dead, which means this. If your body is being redeemed by Jesus now and in the future, then what you do with your body matters. It matters a lot. And it's not yours to do whatever you want with. Paul's being super clear. Being a follower of Jesus involves no compromise when it comes to sexual integrity. In chapters 8 through 10, the issue is about food, but not just food preferences, like do you like or dislike a certain food. The issue the Corinthians were divided over is meat that came from animals sacrificed in the local temples to Greek and Roman gods. And there was a split between the Jewish and non-Jewish Christians about how to respond to this issue. And once again, Paul appeals to some core ideas from the gospel. He says, our allegiance, first and foremost, is to Jesus as Lord, not to any other gods. And so if you're in a situation where there's meat that's been dedicated to another god, and there are people around who might watch you and conclude, oh, look, hey, Christians worship Jesus, and they can worship other gods too. Paul says, if that's the scenario, don't eat the meat. Your loyalty is to Jesus, and you should love those people more than yourself and not mislead them. But Paul quickly qualifies this and says, listen, as Christians, we believe God is the creator of all things, including that animal. And the temple idols, we believe, are just pieces of wood and stone. So if there's no one around who's going to misunderstand your actions and you're hungry, eat up. You're free as a new human in Christ to follow your conscience in these kind of debatable matters. So what makes it okay in one situation to eat, but not in the other? The core principle is love. Love will deny itself and look out for the well-being of other people. And love, God's love, is at the core of the gospel. It's what Jesus did when he died for us. And so Paul says it's what Christians should do for other people. In chapters 11 through 14, Paul moves on and addresses problems in their weekly worship gathering. There were some people who were having really powerful spiritual experiences in the gathering. And so they would start praying out loud in unknown languages. There were other people who might start sharing a teaching or a word from God, and then someone would get up and interrupt them because they wanted to share. And it all was really chaotic, and it was distracting people, especially visitors, from hearing the gospel. So in these chapters, Paul helps them think, first of all, about the purpose of this gathering, to help them see what kind of behaviors are appropriate. He says the gathering is a place where God's Spirit should be working through everybody, and it should happen in a unified way. So he develops this cool metaphor about the church as a human body. It's one, but it has all these different parts, and each part serves a unique and important role. So he goes on to name a whole bunch of things that the Spirit does through all these different people, all for the building up of the church. That's a key phrase in these chapters. And Paul concludes that the highest value in the gathering should be a concept central to the gospel, God's love. And love is a key word in these chapters too. 
Love will compel each person in the gathering to use their role to serve and seek the well-being of others. So Paul applies all this to the Corinthians' problems. Some people think the purpose of the gathering is to have intense spiritual experiences or to get a chance to speak their mind. And Paul says, listen, I'm a big fan of powerful experiences of prayer, but if it distracts other people or freaks them out, I should stop it because I'm loving myself more than I'm loving those people. The gathering around Jesus should be orderly so everybody can learn and sing and worship and hear God speaking to them. The last problem Paul addresses is the issue of Jesus' resurrection and the future hope of Jesus' followers. There were some people in the church who were saying that the idea of resurrection is ridiculous and doesn't really matter to being a Christian. And Paul reacts to this big time. He begins by saying that the resurrection is an indispensable part of the gospel. We believe in it because of the hundreds of eyewitnesses that saw Jesus alive in a physical body after being publicly executed by the Romans. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Paul says, then his death was meaningless. We are all still lost in our sin and selfishness. We should just stop being Christians. Paul then shows in detail how the resurrection was Jesus' victory over death and evil, how it's a source of life and power for us now and the present, and how it's a promise of future hope for the whole world. It's because of the resurrection that we have a reason to be unified around Jesus. It's the reason we have motivation for sexual integrity. It's the source of power for loving other people more than ourselves. And ultimately, it's our hope for victory over death. And so, Paul concludes, we do believe Jesus was raised from the dead, which means this. The gospel is not just moral advice or a recipe for private spirituality. It's an announcement about Jesus that opens up a whole new reality. And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about, seeing every part of life through the lens of that gospel. Another excellent summary from our friends at the the Bible Project. All right, so what we want to do is we want to give you a a statement of summary, then we're going to look at the uh, uh, sort of a skeletal outline to see the flow of this. Then we'll expand upon that and we'll do what we've been doing in all of these books, give you things about uh, the naming of it, uh, the date, setting, purpose. So in Corinth, uh, in the first century, uh, it was a, a leading commercial center. And if you want to position it on a map, it would be what we would call southern Greece. In southern Greece. It was famous uh, for some, some good things, but some bad things. And some of the bad things was it was famously known as a very immoral and pagan city. Paul comes in there uh, in a place not at all with any familiarity with anything of of a godly nature and introduces the gospel, preaches the gospel. And the Lord starts a church. He honors Paul's labor there. Converts are made. Uh, But after he leaves, as you saw in the video, then he begins to get get word uh, about moral and ethical issues doctrinal and practical issues uh, and then issues within the body corporately and also private matters. So he writes this letter to address those things. In fact, we pointed out to you when we began 1 Corinthians that when he says things like concerning this or now concerning, he is, he's, appears to be answering questions that were posed to him. Perhaps in a letter written by the leaders at Corinth that was, that was brought to him or perhaps verbally by folks who brought this to him. So we're going to see uh, how this plays out. He wrote this from Ephesus around 56 AD. Uh, it's an answer that has been, it's been reported to him by uh, the house of Chloe uh, that there are some concerns. Uh, the first is concerns for division. You'll remember that very well. 
Uh, there was a report given for it. There's a reason given for it. Uh, and the report's bad enough, but the reasons do not hold any water. So uh, there's a, there, he gives an answer to the reports of fornication in the body. Uh, incest it would be the, the, the particular sexual sin of, uh, of a man and his stepmom uh, carrying on. Of them taking one another to court. Uh, and then of sexual immorality in general, typically tied to uh, the temple. We'll say a little more about that in a minute. Uh, then there are questions that were asked him. So he's giving answers uh, to uh, things like a marriage. You remember talking about that. Uh, in the light of the gospel being preeminent and relationships being so fraught, should we just not marry and anticipate Jesus' return? Uh, the things offered to idols, as was referenced again. Public worship, where we are right now, looking at all these things that were happening in the context of public worship as they unthinkingly perhaps were bringing some of their experiences from temple worship into the worship of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the resurrection, people denying. We had not gotten there yet, but you're going to see that there are people denying the resurrection. And then the collection in chapter 6. Uh, if you're familiar with Paul's writings, you know that that he spent uh, time everywhere he went challenging the new church to have regard for their brothers and sisters in Christ in Jerusalem, the, the church that burgeoned uh, as an aftermath of Pentecost. And they, uh, they struggled financially uh, throughout the entire New Testament era. Um, and one writer wrote this, he said, Though God was pleased to allow Paul to establish a church in Corinth, Paul finds it very difficult to keep Corinth out of the church, the, the society itself, the influence of the culture. It's a battle we fight today. We should be permeating the culture, and too often in, in, a, in 21st century, the culture tends to permeate the church. Uh, the pagan lifestyle that these folks had lived, practiced, uh, was... was not immediately checked at the door when they came into the body of Christ in Corinth. Paul's letter, if you want to think of a tone for Paul's letter, it's one of discipline or correction. And he, uh, he really has to call upon his apostolic authority. And you see this particularly, we'll see this next week, Lord willing, we'll look at 2 Corinthians on Sunday night where he appeals to his apostolic authority to say, you know, you don't, you don't get to take or leave what I'm telling you here. And so he gives real uh, challenges to them in terms of the divisiveness and the immorality and the lawsuits and the selfishness, the abuses of the Lord's Supper, the abuses of spiritual gifts, the denial of the resurrection. You can imagine if you just put yourself in Paul's place for a minute. He labored there 18 months, a year and a half, laying a foundation. He leaves and he hears from the house of Chloe, What's going on there? And he's wondering, how did, how did they get these things out of what I taught them? Were they even listening? Uh, so he addresses these problems. And in doing so, as the, as the uh, video pointed out, he brings the gospel to bear. The gospel is not, I don't, I don't, don't misunderstand me here, not just a, a message about being saved from hell. The, the gospel is a, is a message of transformation. Uh, as one fellow said, the gospel changes everything about our worldview and our perspective. And so I want you to, I want you to see here in the, in the uh, various passages how he's addressing these, these various issues. Just follow along with me here. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote. It, it, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. So he begins to speak to that. 1 Corinthians 7, 25. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give you my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge, and this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. 1 Corinthians 11, 2. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. And we talk about what that word traditions mean. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. 
1 Corinthians 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. And so you have this, you, you see clearly these divisions in the letter once he addresses uh, the, the, the divisions going on in Corinth, how he, is, he writes the rest of the letter responding to concerns they had appealed to him. And uh, they had the privilege of having Paul for 18 months, and then Apollos was there for a season, then Peter was there for a season preaching. And we talked about this when we went through that section, that uh, it's very easy to slip from appreciation for the ministry of the gospel to preacher worship. To uh, I think they use the term groupie uh, in, the, uh, in the video. Certainly thank God for the gospel. Thank God if he gives you someone who faithfully declares the gospel. But make it about Jesus. And we, we discussed that already. So it was a personality cult that was developing in the mentality. Um, and Paul reminds them it wasn't, it wasn't the wisdom or cleverness of him or, or Apollos or Peter that caused them to come to faith in Christ. Uh, and that the factions were not good. They were bringing reproach upon their witness. That if they were to boast, in the very best sense, they were to boast in Christ and the gospel, not in the servants. Uh, he answers their concern about fornication, uh, chiding them, you should, you should be grieved by this, rather than this you're rejoicing, and points out how they were, they were really missing the whole idea of what it means to be free in Christ. You're free to deny yourself, you're free to serve, uh, free to give yourself, you're not free to do anything you please because you've got this ticket to heaven, so to speak. And so he challenges them to exercise church discipline in the face of this. Uh, and warns them about immorality, that the climate they would have come out of. And then, of course, these questions that I mentioned earlier, the different, the different things set before him, marriage and uh, meat offered to idols and those kind of things. So having kind of given you a sketch of, of what the book is about, what about the uh, title of it? If you, if you could, it's, it's interesting Corinth was the most important city in Greece during this period in the first century. It, was a, it was, had a, a worldwide commerce. And with that, people coming from a lot of different places for commerce, uh, there was sort of an amalgamation of culture, which, and you know what that means, and I don't want to appear to be speaking ill or evil here, but, but when you bring... When our country receives masses of people from other cultures, if they don't come here committed to embracing the structure of the culture here, then there will be a, a blending that necessarily means the downgrading of the culture. That does not mean that American culture is perfect, but historically America was built upon some ideals, a, Judeo, a clear Judeo-Christian foundation, even by the deists who were part of the founding of it, they, they appealed to the Judeo-Christian Foundation. And when you have folks coming in from pagan uh, backgrounds, when you have people coming in from a false religion, uh, necessarily that culture is downgraded. Well, that's what was happening uh, in, in Corinth. It was already a pagan culture, but it just went, it went from bad to worse. And, of course, they had there the temple, uh, the pagan temple that was idolatrous. Paul comes in and founds a church. Now, I want us to read. I want us to look here. Look at Acts 8, 18, 1 to 17 and just read about the founding of the church in Corinth. I think it's good for us to take the time to do that. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. So he's been in Athens, Greece. He's going to southern Greece. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. We looked at that last week when we were studying Romans. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, uh, tent makers, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks, these Hellenistic Greeks, remember, who would have, would have had a Greek background but were embracing uh, Judaism. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that, that the Christ was Jesus for the Jews, the, the Messiah, remember? The Jewish word is Messias for Messiah. 
the Greek word of the same idea is, is Christos, which means the anointed one. Both, both mean anointed one. So he's reasoning that the Christ, their Messiah, was Jesus of Nazareth. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments to these folks in the Jewish synagogue and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. No, but I'm innocent of your blood. I've, I've told you the truth. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. It's a marked difference for Paul. If you've read him up to this point in Acts, he, his first place he would go would be to the synagogue. He would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the, to the Jews. And he left there and went to, to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, this is fascinating here, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, because he's, he's receiving threats, do not be afraid. Go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you. Notice these assertions. I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you. They may try to come after you, but you will, they will not, I won't let them harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. What a great encouragement to go on. Why should I continue? If I shook the dust off my feet of the Jews, why not just leave? Well, there's a church being birthed. The Lord comes to him and encourages him and assures him, keep on, don't stop. I have many people in this city I intend to save, and I'm going to use your witness, your gospel witness as a tool, as a means to save. So he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio, who was proconsul of Achaia, uh, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law, that is, to the, to the, uh, to the Mosaic law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words, and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove the Jews from the tribunal. Think about this. This is, this is a tangible demonstration of what God promised Paul in the vision. Keep on preaching. No one's going to attack you to harm you. I'm with you. I have people I intend to save here. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him <laughs> in front of the tribunal. And you wonder there, was, was it Sosthenes' idea that they do this? You, you, you wonder. Was it, he said, we, we need to get Paul, take him before the uh, Gallio and tell him the problem and let him, let him take care of this problem. And instead it turns to be an embarrassment where you have the proconsul of Achaia saying, you know something? It's just about words to me, names to me. This is, in other words, he's saying this is a petty complaint that you bring to me. And so the Jews of the synagogue are embarrassed. And then Gallio paid no attention. He didn't even arrest them. So uh, they harmed their own. This is, you know, we live in a strange day in, in the 21st century, but this is not the first time that people have just carried on as madmen. I mean, you analyze this, there is no sensibility in, in their response to Gallio's uh, deferring, just saying, you, you handle it. They were unhinged in their response. And so we have this founding of the church at Corinth, recorded in Acts. There's, we call this uh, 1 Corinthians, we'll get into the title in a minute. He references earlier in the letter, my previous letter. We don't have that letter. We don't know. Let's go here. He writes another letter 
that we know as 2 Corinthians. So there's a possibility that there, there were three letters of communication with this church. Only two have survived to be a part of the canon of Scripture. In, in 1 Corinthians, you read just real life. <clears throat> I think Barry and I were talking about this yesterday. Just the unvarnished transparency of Scripture. It pulls no punches. The, the problems, the pressures, the struggles of a church called out of a pagan society. Every now and then I get, I get a note from somebody who's, who's frustrated with, with the life they're living in their current New Testament church setting. And they say, I just wish I could have been a member of one of the churches in the New Testament. And I'll typically write back and say, which one? Corinth? <laughs> Where they were, they were taking sides over their favorite preacher. They, uh, they were winking at immorality. They were abusing the Lord's Supper. You, know, you want me to go on? You, you want to be uh, Colossians? Where they were dealing with, with uh, incipient Gnosticism there and, and getting caught up in, in the debate between libertinism and legalism. Uh, Philippians, where you had two prominent women in the church who took sides and people were lining up behind them and, and causing you know, friction. Which, which one? Ephesus that, that was told in the Revelation, I'm going to put out your lampstand if you don't return to loving me. Which of these New Testament churches do you wish you had been a member? Thessalonica, where they were so preoccupied with the second coming of Jesus that they stopped working, they stopped taking care of themselves. No. When you read... The New Testament, honestly, and you read these letters, particularly to the churches, you realize there were problems there. And I said to you at the outset of this study, back when we started over a year ago in 1 Corinthians, when you read through the problems, if you, if, if you can address 1 Corinthians, as Paul does, the church at Corinth, to the brothers, to the, to the, to the followers of Jesus, then, then any, most any church that loves Jesus, even though it may be floundering, in front, it should feel good to be called a church, that it can be called a church. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to have all of its doctrines straight. These folks here, they're people in Corinth that, that reject the resurrection. We'll see that in a minute. So they're real. Factions, lawsuits, immorality, questionable practices, abuse of the Lord's Supper, abuse of spiritual gifts. So he addresses them with the gospel. And, that, and the gospel is our only hope, and the gospel does provide the answers and the application if we will embrace it and consider the implications of it in our various circumstances in life we will always be led on the right path when you look at the oldest recorded title of this letter uh, it is uh, pros corinthios corinthius a or alpha in other words to the corinthians that's what uh, a the first and uh, to distinguish it from probably the, the second letter that we know about. The authorship of Paul has really never been questioned. And remember, we've been, we've been through a lot of studies at this point, a lot of books of the Bible where we look and say, well, people challenge this authorship. People ch the authorship of this has never been questioned. Paul is almost universally accepted. Now, you have, you've got liberals who question everything, but we don't, we don't take them into account when we look at, at scholarship that takes a, a serious look at, at the, uh, the grammatical historical context of these books. You can find the affirmation of this as early as 95 AD, which is early when you think about uh, these letters not always surviving immediately being found later. Clement of Rome uh, wrote to the Corinthian church and cited this letter in regard to their continuing problem of having divisions. So, so it's a reference to the reality of Paul writing it. Um, Corinth, as I said earlier, was a key city in Greece and it was destroyed by the Romans uh, in 146 B.C. And Julius Caesar uh, re rebuilt it as a Roman colony 100 years later uh, in 46 B.C., which is when it began to, to prosper. It became the capital of the province of Achaia. That's why they, they went to Gallio, the proconsul who was in, would have been housed in Corinth. This is an interesting thing I found. The official language of Corinth was Latin. Roman background. But the common language remained Greek when we talked about the intertestinal period and the Alexander the Great and the, and the influence he cast across the known world. So you, if you had 
if you had written and uh, been considered uh, someone of importance, uh, you would have spoken uh, Latin. But if you were one of the common people, you would speak Koine Greek, which would explain why Paul would write the letter in Koine Greek, the common the Greek of the common people. It was a metropolis of the uh, of the Peloponnesus uh, chain there, and uh, it was located, if I can describe this to you, on a, on a narrow isthmus uh, between the Aegean Sea and the Adriatic Sea. In fact, there's stories that people would sail up to this, and they would, if you can imagine, they would build these frameworks. If it had a particularly large ship, it was easier to to cross the isthmus carrying the ship on logs. Have you ever seen this done? In some, where they would cut a bunch of logs and lay them out, and they would just keep pushing the ship over the logs and bring the, bring the logs in the back, back to the front, and they would do this, and it would actually would, would cross over from one sea to the other rather than sail around. It was more efficient uh, for purposes of commerce. These two seas had two uh, seaports. It became a, a strong commercial center. Uh, by the way, this isthmus was about a 200-mile journey if you, wanted to, if you wanted to go that way for 200 miles. Uh, Nero, I saw, I found this, thought it was an interesting anecdote, attempted to build a canal at the narrowest point of this isthmus, uh, but did not do it. In fact, the canal was not built to fairly recency, 1893, uh, there was a canal built across it so you could actually sail from one uh, side to the other. The city was filled with shrines and with temples, but the most prominent was the temple of Aphrodite. Uh, sat on top of an, an 1800 foot uh, mount. It was called Acro uh, Corinthus, this, this mountain. They worshiped there, Aphrodite, the goddess of love. So you, it doesn't take a, much of an imagination to understand where all of the, the sexual aberrants came through, came from. In this temple of Aphrodite, there were 1,000 consecrated prostitutes who were there to carry out the, quote, worship uh, of Aphrodite. And so people would, uh, would frequent that. It was basically a brothel set up in the name of religion. Pleasure seekers would come to, the, to spend money on a holiday and to, and to take a holiday from morality. It became so notorious, Corinth, Corinth did, that the term Corinthiadzomai was coined, to act like a Corinthian. I told you that when we were first studying this, that if you wanted to insult a woman in that part of the world in Paul's day, particularly in Greece, you would, you would refer to her as a Corinthian woman. It was a great insult to her. You were basically calling her a, a woman of ill repute, a prostitute. Population was around 700,000 back when Paul was, was laboring there. And this, I found this interesting. Two-thirds of the population were slaves. So four to 500,000 slaves, a couple of hundred thousand uh, slave owners. Interesting, interesting setting there. There were no philosophers, but Greek philosophy, in, I think in an undercurrent way, strongly influenced uh, the kind of speculative approach to, to truth and reality there. And it's in this setting that Paul comes to preach the gospel. So we just, we think about, uh, and he did this on his second missionary journey, by the way. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul's talking about, he's re reflecting, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So he went in there and sowed. 1 Corinthians 3.10, he said, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. And what, he's, what he was doing there, of course, is he's chatting them about their, their outcroppings of carnality in Corinth and saying, you know, the foundation was laid. He's, he's quite sure that he laid a solid gospel foundation. He says, be careful what you're putting on top of that. 1 Corinthians uh, 4, 15, for though you have countless guides in Christ, the people who have come through to, to nurture them, you do not have many fathers. 
For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He's speaking there of God using him to, to plant the church there. And so, uh, humanly speaking, the converts, that the folks who came to Christ in that initial church plant, Paul says, you're my children. Uh, and whoever else has been saved since I'm gone, uh, remember me, I'm, tell, I'm talking to you like a father would talk to his children. And of course, Acts 18, 1 to 7, we already read that. Um, we won't go through that again. If you remember the background in Acts, he was being persecuted in Macedonia, and that's why he left there and went to Athens, where he ends up engaging the Areopagites on the Acropolis, uh, challenging them. I, I remember that. I see you're very religious people. I see all these uh, statues to all of your gods, and I notice there's even an inscription to to the unknown God. You want to be sure you cover your bases. And that's when Paul said, this God that you don't know, I want to tell you about him. And he preached the gospel to them there. All right? It's from Athens, then he proceeded to Corinth. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9, which gives us a little background to, to Silas and Timothy joining him. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you, talking to the church at Corinth. When I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. That's Timothy and Silas he's talking about. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. And then in Philippians 4.15 he says, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, okay, so he went to Athens, but on the corner, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. You, you Philippians are the ones who supported me when I traveled to, to Athens and then spent a year and a half in Corinth. While he was in Corinth, just as a side note, he wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. He shook his feet off in the synagogue and set up shop uh, in the house of Titius Justus. Saw the synagogue leader Christus, Crispus converted. He labored there from 51 to 52 AD. And Apollos uh, followed him in. As I referenced 1 Corinthians 3, 6 a while ago, I planted Apollos watered. In Acts 18, 24 to 28, now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, so where is that? He's headed into to the area of the Corinthians. The brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. So he comes in to strengthen the work in Corinth. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ, their Messiah, was Jesus. And so... To give a little context of where Paul was when he hears from the household of Chloe, he was teaching and preaching in, in Ephesus during his third missionary journey, and he gets these reports that come in. 1 Corinthians 16, 17 says it was a delegation of three men, and they came on behalf of the congregation wanting his judgment on some, some pressing matters. So 1 Corinthians uh, was written in 56 A.D., all right? So let's shift to the, to the themes, our theme and purpose of 1 Corinthians. So the, basically, uh, you, could, you could come out the themes, the sufficiency of the gospel would be a, a fair theme, but it's the application of Christian principles on an individual and social level, that the, that the gospel matters. The gospel has the answers to life's challenges. The cross of Christ when I came, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That that's the lenses that you have to put on. 
designed to transform the lives of believers and make them different as a people individually, as family units, and as corporate uh, congregations. They're different from the surrounding world. Paul maintains that you can, you can be saved by the gospel and you can live the transforming implications of the gospel even in one of the most wicked cities in the world. But the Corinthians were not doing that. And that's what troubled Paul, that they were, they were compromising the gospel witness. They were casting aspersion on the power of the gospel to change lives. So he writes to correct these things. He says in 1 Corinthians 4, 14, and 15, I do not write these things to make you ashamed. In other words, I'm, I'm not just blistering you for the sake of venting my anger. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. And that's when he says, though you have countless guides, you don't have many fathers. So he, he tells them his tone. He tells them his hope. But he wants them to act like Christians. 1 Corinthians 4.21 What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? How, how uh, stubborn are you on these things? Are you teachable? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? That's what he wanted to do. Well, let's look at some keys then. Obviously the uh, a, a key phrase, there could be several, but a key phrase is gospel correction, where you, where you bring the gospel to bear to correct uh, error in doctrine and error in, in lifestyle. The key verses we read at the outset just remind them that the, they don't belong to themselves anymore. I think it's interesting. There's a, there's a certain uh, Holy Spirit irony here. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Where was what, what the problem? They're spending time in this temple of Aphrodite. But your body is a temple, he says. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So use your temple to glorify God, just like the folks at the temple of Aphrodite said that by their debauched lifestyle, they were glorifying their God. They were pleasing Aphrodite. And then he promises them that though while it may be tempting to come out of a culture like that, live in the midst of that as, as transformed people, that, that it's not so great a temptation that they can rationalize in their minds, I just couldn't help myself. He says, no, God is faithful. The temptation may be great, but God is faithful. And he always, in the face of your temptation, provides a way of escape. And his purpose is that you may be able to endure it, not, not be subjected to it, not succumb to it, but endure it, bear through it, resist it. And in doing that, every time that a, that a Corinthian believer resisted the temptation that surrounded him in his culture, he proved the power of the gospel greater than the power of sensuality that was, that was constantly around him. The key chapter would not surprise you is chapter 13. Yeah, we, we read this at weddings. I hardly ever do a wedding that I don't read 1 Corinthians 13. Because that is the love that I hope a husband shows to his wife. It's the love that I hope a wife shows to her husband. And we're going to see when we get to 1 Corinthians 13 in the mornings that when you read through that, you're reading a profile of Jesus Christ. One of my pastor friends says that in Jesus, you see the law walking. I would say I agree with that, but I would also say in Jesus, you see the love. You see love walking and the way he related. But it wasn't written primarily for a wedding. It was written to show that this is the path to work through and overcome all of your troubles at Corinth. Love means you will be sensitive, and though you may be thankful to God for the pastor you have or the pastor you had, that you will not make him an issue, but make the gospel the issue. 
Love does that to you. Love means that you will speak the truth in love. You will love enough to confront when immorality crops its head up in the church. Love means you will bear with someone, even if wronged, rather than take them to court and, and embarrass the witness of that church in a, in a primarily pagan culture that says, oh, I thought these folks were supposed to be different. <laughs> See, love helps you to bear with. Love helps you to deny yourself when you're talking about food sacrifice to idols. And, and on and on. You see, the, you see the pattern here. Love, love will temper how your corporate worship uh, is undertaken. And you won't put yourself forward. You won't try to make more of your gifts uh, to the, to the uh, disenchantment of others and their gifts. You will make much of them. You will build them up rather than build yourself up. Love. So this, he sets that forward. It's more than an emotion. It's a commitment. I've told couples through the years when I've counseled them, and they said, well, I've just fallen out of love. I said, no, 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 no. I said, you may fall out of a car. You may fall into a hole, but you don't fall in and out of love. Love is a conscious commitment to self-deny, to think more highly of others than you do yourself. It's an action, and you see that in 1 Corinthians 13. So when John is writing in John 3 and telling us about Jesus and Nicodemus' encounter, God so loved the world that he sent, he acted. Okay. Well, how, we begin to wrap this up here. Seeing Jesus in 1 Corinthians. I told you when we came to the New Testament, in the Old Testament it's, it's obvious. This is anticipating Messiah. In, in the New Testament, we're seeing the life of Jesus worked out, particularly in the Gospels. Now moving beyond Acts and Romans and into the letters how is he depicted? In 1 Corinthians, Paul wants these folks to know that Jesus Christ, his life, death, burial, and resurrection is significant at every turn. That you will never face anything in life that cannot be brought into focus thinking about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the implication of that brought to your life in the gospel. The worst people you deal with, the answer for them is the gospel. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 30, Jesus says, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, notice, wisdom from God. The gospel puts us in a context where Godly wisdom helps us to overcome human foolishness. But came to us wisdom from God. Righteousness. Not only the one who holds up the perfect standard of righteousness as the law walking, but the one who becomes our righteousness, who gives us hope that when we are struggling with our sin, that we have been justified. We've been declared not guilty and accepted as righteous not for the sake of anything we have done, have not done, hope to do, but only for the sake of who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do, and that being applied to us. Sanctification. Hebrews 12 says, Seeing we're compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race it's been marked out for us to run. We're not competing with one another. We're running the race marked out for us. How do we do that? Looking unto Jesus. How do, you, how do you grow in grace? Looking unto Jesus, the author, remembering that he, he began the good work in us, the finisher. He will bring it to completion, Paul said. The author and finisher of our faith. How do we face struggle? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross? We remind ourselves, you know, you say, well, I was really mistreated. You know, I may have been mistreated, but nobody's ever stripped me naked and nailed me to a cross. And that's where Jesus was. We look unto Jesus and we find there the wherewithal to grow in grace by the Spirit. And redemption. Redemption, remember, is the purchase out of the slave market. When the devil lies to you and says, you're nothing but a slave, you can't beat this, you're never going to... We said, wait a minute. <laughs> Precious blood bought me out of this. You're not going to coax me back in to a status as a slave to you. 
Jesus Christ is all of that and more. And so Paul sets him before the Corinthians as this to keep him before them as they work through their, their errors of their ways, their thoughts, their conduct. And then, of course, the contribution of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians gives us a way to approach and, and deal with, uh, with basic social and, and moral and spiritual issues. Romans, of course, I said last week, this is a, a very, uh, one person I think said, a rhetorically elegant treatise to a church where Paul had never been. He wants to give them the gospel laid out. 1 Corinthians is not like that. In fact, though it's written by the same person, same author, it's plain, a lot of intensity, and it's unvarnished. He didn't pull any punches. Romans is written to, for Paul to further introduce himself to that church, hoping to come there one day. Corinthians is written looking back, having been there, saying, what in the world's happened? The sentence structure even, one writer pointed out, is, is uncomplicated. Paul uses narrative. He uses sarcasm. He makes strong appeals. But 1 Corinthians makes some major contributions to New Testament doctrine. The doctrine of the church is an organism. We're looking at that on Sunday mornings now. The role of spiritual gifts, the, the, how critical the resurrection is. You can't talk meaningfully about the cross of Jesus Christ without talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As was stated on the video, without the resurrection, the cross has no real meaning other than an example of great love. But the cross and resurrection changes everything. No other letter in the New Testament gives a better look at how there can be problems and situations, un unhappy, unhealthy situations, in a New Testament church. Think about this. Well, we'd love to have the Apostle Paul as a pastor for 18 months. It'd be great. That's where he was for 18 months. And all of these challenges. Corinth bristled with social and ethical and spiritual and doctrinal problems. It was not an easy letter for Paul to write, no doubt. But he demonstrates a powerful apostolic authority mixed with uh, challenges and love. In terms of length, only Romans is longer in the New Testament letters. But even though it's 16 chapters, it's really easy to follow as we've been going through this. Because you see how he developed his thoughts to answer their challenges, their questions, their concerns. And that's an overview of 1 Corinthians. Any, any questions or comments, observations before we dismiss tonight?